cut it off there. Okay, our next speaker is Paul Thernali from the University of Warwick, and he'll be talking on wear and tear. <laughs> Okay, I'd like to uh, thank Aubrey for the invitation. Uh, I've wondered for several years what goes on in these uh, symposia, and now it's my delight to find out and uh, be part of the schedule. And so I want to talk today about increased damage to proteins in aging, wear and tear uh, that is potentially avoidable, we believe. Uh, uh, I and uh, Nilo Avani speaking uh, later in this session are from the University of Warwick Medical School, and we're both joint appointments between medical school and systems biology. So uh, we study protein damage. We've been using stable isotopic dilution analysis tandem mass spectrometry, the gold standard quantitative mass spectrometric method, uh, to study protein damage for about uh, 10, 10 years now. Uh, and physiological protein damage is a, con uh, is a continual structural and functional impairment of the proteome. And it is of different types. Of course, spontaneous damage is oxidation, and I show you here on the graphic of human serum albumin, the hot spots for modification. And in so doing, I raise one of the really important points about protein damage that we now accept, that it's not random. There are neighboring group interactions within proteins that make for really high selectivity for some types of damage in some proteins. Uh, there's nitration. In this case, it goes on uh, the tyrosine residues here. There's what we call early glycation, which are the conventional adducts with glucose making uh, fructosamine residues in, uh, in human serum albumin. It's lysine 525 <coughs> predominantly. And then there is advanced glycation. And there are many compounds uh, that, that represent advanced glycation end products. But the quantitatively most important one is actually on arginine residues. And we showed a few years ago that uh, it's the adduct of methylglyoxal with arginine 410 in, uh, in human serum albumin. And normally, about 1% of albumin is modified at this point, and it goes up to about 3% or more in diabetic patients. Um, so protein damage is increased in aging and several disease states that I mentioned here, diabetes, renal failure, and arthritis that we've studied. Uh, and it may be related to... Uh, to uh, progression, to the progression of the condition, be it aging or disease, uh, and also remedial intervention, whether we can take a rejuvenation therapy intervention or in diabetes, renal failure, whether we can control metabolic status and increased uh, clearance of uh, urinic toxins. Um, there are many uh, adducts that are, uh, are produced by oxidative damage of proteins. There are the th cysteine thiol related adducts, and we tend not to get into this area ourselves much, but we quantify uh, methionine sulfoxide, dityrosine, nitrotyrosine, and formalkynurinine, major adducts of protein oxidation, as a matter of course, in, in a panel of about 20 chemically defined protein damage markers that we measure uh, concurrently by uh, LCMSMS. Glycation adducts are the early glycation adducts, the fructosamines, and then there are lysine-derived ages, carboxymethyl lysine, a widely studied age, carboxyethyl lysine, pyrrolin here on lysine. And then there are the arginine-derived ages. And arginine is the site to which dicarbonyl metabolites uh, are taken uh, in reactions with proteins, and so their reactions are di arginine-directed. And MGH1, I'll be mentioning again, is the, derived from methylglyoxal, a dicarbonyl produced from triose phosphates. Quantitatively, it's the most important AGE in our bodies. Uh, but there are other types of AGE that cross that uh, cross-link proteins. Uh, and in relation to the previous talk, because cross-linking is uh, irreversible and, da and damages protein function, then it's all also of great interest. And the glycation adducts have been often associated with fluorescence, and one of them is an intense fluorophore and has often been measured, and that is pentosidine. Arginine modification is important because 
Bioinformaticians will tell you that arginine has the highest probability of being located in a functional domain of a protein. And when arginines are modified this way, they lose their functional role and the protein becomes functionally impaired. Um, so uh, when we started studying protein damage, we quickly realized that in, uh, in, in physiological fluids there were da and in tissues there were damaged proteins, there were damaged peptides that come from partial proteolysis, and also there were what we call uh, glycation nitration oxidation free adducts, or the glycated oxidized nitrated amino acids that are released when, you, when the cells proteolize damaged proteins. And you can see these in all fluids, in plasma, in synovial fluid, uh, in, uh, 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 in all physiological fluids, and of course excreted in urine. And we're excreting the proteolytic debris of damp protein damage all the time. Uh, our urine, for example, is about 5 micromolar with respect to that MGH1 methylglyoxal arginine adduct. Uh, and we developed technology for mesh quantifying these adducts really carefully. One thing you have to do if you're measuring damaged proteins, you have to be careful that you don't damage them during the course of preparing for analysis. So you need really carefully <coughs> well-validated techniques. We use exhaustive enzymatic hydrolysis when we're quantifying total amounts of any type of damage, as opposed to the limited proteolysis used in proteomic peptide mapping. Uh, and we fully automate this on a nice little robot produced in Swi by a Swiss company. Uh, and then we use LCMSMS with stable isotopic dilution analysis, uh, which is the only way to do robust quantitative mass spectrometry. Uh, this is our current LCMSMS, we're just about to pay t which has limits of detection of, a, uh, of the low femtomol for most analytes. <laughs> we're just about to take delivery of the latest. Waters LCMSMS, where we're going to get about 100 fold improvement in sensitivity. So we can really detect damage in very small amounts of protein now. We did some work with, uh, in collaboration with Linda Partridge, probably the leading expert on, on Drosophila studies in aging. And you can see the responses we get. These are the responses we get from proteolytic digest. This is our MGH1. Uh, the chemists amongst us will probably appreciate that MGH1 is a mixture of two epimers that we can partly resolve, so we expect to see two peaks, and we do. This is n 4 markinurin In the bottom here is our stable isotopic standard with different mass, but they ionize with the same efficiency in the mass spectrometry source and act as the perfect internal standard. And, and Knowing about uh, proteolytic handling of damaged proteins, we put together this multi-compartmental schematic model of when proteins are damaged in tissues, they undergo proteolysis and release these damaged amino acids. They're released into blood plasma. They're low molecular mass, so they're easily filtered in the glomerulus. So they're like amino acids, so they can be re actively reabsorbed by organic anion cation transporters. They have anyway a net excretion or, a fil uh, or clearance through the kidney, and we're excreting them all the time in the, in the urine. And of course, for rejuvenation therapy, this could potentially represent a flux of formation in the body and a nice non invasive m measure of whether our intervention is decreasing the total body uh, of, of protein damage flux. But there is a, a problem, of course, is that we're ingesting damaged proteins all the time. Uh, and those that are not too heavily damaged, we di digest and we absorb damaged amino acids from those. So we have to find ways of correcting for that. And we are one of the few groups that actually has measured damaged peptides from ingested proteins in portal venous plasma. So it does happen, and it makes uh, the analysis a little bit more complicated. But we're systems biologists, and uh, if proteins are very highly damaged, we can't digest them and we get just excrete them. But we're systems biologists, and we want to try and produce a mathematical model for the entire balance between uh, protein damage and excretion, and measuring the steady state levels and protein turnover in tissue. And this is what we're tasked with setting ourselves in the years to come, so that we can explain the different tissue contributions to the flux of damaged amino acids that we see excreted in urine um, and change the look at the effect of aging, disease state, and any intervention, rejuvenation intervention or, the, or otherwise. 
Uh, so uh, we talk that we call this proteomics of protein damage, where we're quantifying these chemically defined types of protein damage. With the urinary excretions, we can relate to total flux of damage and clearance from tissues. Uh, and we also go in pursuit of the proteins that are particularly susceptible to damage, and when they're damaged, what functional impairment means. And so we're then invo involved in uh, conventional proteomics, where we take care not to damage the proteins doing the proteomic analysis, but identify hot spots for different types of damage. So I'll go back to this uh, glycation damage by dicarbonyls because it's a, a thing very close to uh, our hearts and indeed our research grants that are funded in our group and the results we're expected to produce. So methylglyoxal mainly targets arginine residues and converts, it seems to seek out the functionally important arginine residues, converts them to a hydroamidazolone that has lost charge, is slightly bigger, and so anything that was binding to that arginine through electrostatic interaction now doesn't want to know, can't find its home for binding. And so it potentially can have a great effect on protein function. Probably you, you may not have come across methylglyoxal before, but we all produce it. We can't avoid producing it because it forms spontaneously from triosphosphates. 0.1% normally of triosphosphates degrade to methylglyoxal in a non-oxidative reaction. It's just an elimination of phosphate. Uh, if we starve ourselves and induce cytochrome P452E1 and get some acetone in, in, our, in, our, in our blood, then uh, that will also be oxidized. That is an oxidative reaction uh, to methylglyoxal. But the main source of methylglyoxal production normally is through triosphosphate degradation. If GAP-DH is inhibited, triosphosphates accumulate, then we can get up to much higher fluxes of methylglyoxal. And that happens for example, in certain cells in the diabetic state where triosphosphates accumulate and methylglyoxal flux of formation goes up a ten, tenfold. Now, methylglyoxal is produced anywhere in glycolytic life, and so life has had to accommodate the production of methylglyoxal, and to do so, it's produced itself a nice protective enzymatic system called the glyoxylase system, Glyoxylase 1 catalyzes the isomerization of the methylglyoxal glutathione adduct to s lactyl glutathione, and then glyoxylase 2 is a thiol esterase, hydrolyzes it through to D-lactate, and reforms glutathione. Very little of our glutathione is held as s lactyl glutathione at any one point, and it's glyoxylase 1 that takes away the danger of modification of protein by methylglyoxal, and I mentioned in the earlier session also DNA is damaged by methylglyoxal too. Now actually glyoxylase 1 has been studied in aging research for many years, and I don't go, I'm not going to go through all these, you'll be pleased to hear, but uh, I want to draw your attention, and this is a review that we published this year, I want to draw, draw to your attention to just a couple of things that are very important, I believe. One is that methylglyoxal is a major uh, uh, is a precursor of the major damaged adduct in the proteome in physiological systems, and also it's a major adduct of DNA. And we showed with collaborators, I'll show you shortly, that if you overexpress glyoxylase 1 in C. elegans, you increase median and maximum lifespan. And also that glyoxylase 1, now we know, is a hotspot for copy number variation. This means that some of us can have up to maybe four copies of the glyoxylase 1 promoter, and we can be expressing glyoxylase 1 fourfold higher than other people. In fact, because this occurs through genetic recombination, it's somatic. You can have fourfold of glyoxylase 1 promoter when neither your mother or your father did. And if we're right in believing this is linked to life extension, then you could live longer than your mother and father simply by virtue that you've got this copper number variation. And I think Copy number variation in protective genes is an area that needs really exploring in aging research because it could explain the, some of the, um, the dispersion of mean a, of, of a lifespan in organisms uh, outside of just looking for conventional mutations. And so <coughs> we did some work by collaboration on the C. elegans model. Actually, we're not C. elegans experts. Michael Morcos in... Heidelberg did most of the work with the worms, and I get fortunate enough just to show you the data, but we found that glyoxylase 1 expression declines in rather old C. elegans of 12 days old, 
And what Michael did was overexpress glyoxylase 1 in C. elegans and then do a conventional uh, survival study. And he found that actually this is the glyoxylase 1 transgenic and this is the glyoxylase 1 silencing study. This is the wild type. And he found that overexpression of glyoxylase 1 in C. elegans increased median and maximum lifespan by about 30% and silencing decreases lifespan by 40%. So this was the first time dicarbonyl glycation or the protection against it had been linked to a longevity effect and now we think of glyoxylase 1 as a, as a vitagene. Now, of course, we're, we're fascinated by damage to proteins in these worms, so we had a look at, at the glucose-derived adducts, the, some of the AGEs, and there's no change in the transgenic. We looked at the uh, glyoxal and methylglyoxal adducts uh, that are substrates for glyoxylase 1, and they were decreased in the proteome, protein extracts of the C. elegans. But our great surprise was also overexpression of glyoxylase 1 was protecting against oxidative damage and nitration damage. And the great question is why? Because it's a non oxidative process, this dicarbonyl modification. So, how can you protect against oxidative stress? Well, the, the, the answer seemed to be that when we looked at staining in mitochondria and staining for the MGH1 adduct, that a lot of the mitochondrial proteins were targets for this glycation. Uh, and modification of mitochondrial proteins was then leading to uncoupling of electron transport pathways uh, and leakage of more peroxide from mitochondrial production of ROS. Uh, so this is the methylglyoxal protein adduct levels in the, the silenced glyoxylase 1 and the transgenic glyoxylase 1. And then this led to increased superoxide production. And this is some of the uh, these uh, dihydroethidium staining where in the wild type we see the ROS being produced by mitochondria with the glyoxylase 1 transgenic. This is knocked down with the glyoxylase 1 silencing. It's taken up. And these are the, some of the, uh, the mitochondrial inhibitor controls. So, and this is a quantitation of the ROS where the glyoxylase 1 transgenic was taking down the production of the mitochondrial ROS. So, what can we learn from this? Well, we can learn that enhanced protection against dicarbonyl glycation increases lifespan of C. elegans. Uh, oops, something's gone wrong there. Oh, yep. uh, decreased protection against dicarbonyl glycation decreases lifespan of C. elegans, so it can really pose a survival threat. And I think it's done. And um, glycation by methylglyoxal is not oxidative, but it can stimulate oxidative stress indirectly. And the new stress this year I want to introduce you to is dicarbonyl stress. When the, an imbalance between dicarbonyl production and its metabolism in, in favor of the former, leading to increased protein damage and threat to lifespan. Uh, and we call proteins damaged by dicarbonyls, methylglyoxal, the dicarbonyl proteome. And we've identified some typical proteins, albumin, hemoglobin, lens crystallins, and mitochondrial proteins, some targets. Uh, and intriguingly, extracellular matrix proteins, particularly where integrins bind. And when the arginine in the integrin binding site of RGD and GFOGI is modified by methylglyoxal, the integrins can no longer bind and the endothelial cells float away and die by detachment stimulated apoptosis or anoikis. And you can see increased numbers of circulating endothelial cells in conditions where there's increased dicarbonyl, such as diabetes, renal failure, and some reports in, in elderly people as well. Uh, and there's some signaling proteins uh, as well. And we're still in the hunt for many more dicarbonyl susceptible uh, proteins. So we envisage analogous to uh, glycation, uh, oxidative stress with pro-oxidants and antioxidants. We have anti-glycation defenses. We have uh, ex exogenous and endogenous sources, and we have these glycating agents, and they're linked to aging as well as disease. Uh, so here, of course, we're interested in, in aging and trying to slow it or even reverse it. And... Uh, Rejuvenation, of course, we're trying to take it in the reverse direction. I was looking on uh, Google Images last night trying to find a nice image for healthy aging, and I thought it's a personal thing, so I should show you some images of myself. 
And um, in 92, that was me sitting there with a microscope in the lab, and in 2008, this is me. I think I haven't aged too badly. And the microscope performance has improved. I've got a better microscope. And we're all obsessed by citation indices, and I've now got a H factor higher than my year, years in lifespan, in my aging years. So I think that is quite nice. And also, then um, I like the giant fruit that goes to see the doctor. I, I too want to live to a ripe old age. <laughs> and um, one way I think uh, you can do it, and we're committed to this, is by activating something called the anti-stress gene response. And this is the transcriptional system involving uh, NRF2, nuclear factor uh, E2 related factor 2. It's a transcription factor with an inhibitory protein, KEEP1, that has up to this point just been related to prevention of oxidative damage to the proteome by activation of expression of uh, antioxidant linked gene products. But, uh, and this is a schematic uh, system that just, slide, that just summarizes what we know about how NRF2 is normally held in the cytosol on activation moves into the nucleus and induces protected gene expression. And um, we're very interested in dietary activators in fruits and vegetables, and this is a potential way that we could lead to healthier foodstuffs that, to, to support healthy aging and maybe even rejuvenation. Uh, the intriguing thing is the switch-off system that has been given little thought so far, but we're working on that too. Um, so we know that it protects against oxidative damage, this system, if we activate it. But then now we know also it protects against glycation because there's aldoketoreductases and dehydrogenases that metabolize methylglyoxal, so it protects against that too. Uh, and um, it protects against metabolic stress because it can activate the pentose phosphate pathway and drive triosphosphates away to pentose sugars and prevent methylglyoxal formation and other dysfunction. And it protects against lipogenic stress because it downregulates these regulators of so-called lipogenic gene expression. And if all else fails and proteins are damaged, then it helps speed their removal as well. And so this is one reason why anybody involved in protein damage has to be working on the NRF2 system. And indeed, indeed we are. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Paul Talalay and John Hopkins discovered a compound from broccoli sulforaphane, which is a really nice activator of this system. And we've done some nice uh, nanostring quantitative mRNA measurements in endothelial cells, stimulating with sulforaphane. And you can see the different gene markers of the different pathways are activated. NRF2, where it actually expression is taken down itself a bit here as we've enhanced the protection in the cells. P65 of the inflammatory signaling pathway expression goes down and VCAM1 goes down, although it tends to creep up a little bit because endothelial cells in culture medium are not in their optimum environment. But nevertheless, the, uh, the uh, inflammatory marker has been decreased by sulforaphane treatment. Um, and we've done uh, time course studies of different ARA linked genes and also quantified protein damage and protection of, against protein damage with this stimulation. And you'll see in a poster that we've got here, one of the problems that the NRF2 system has in aging is that the expression of NRF2 declines in aging, as well as then ARA linked gene expression, and we're trying to protect that. I've just almost finished. So just in one slide, I'll show you a, a graphical abstract of a project we've been doing, uh, supported by the Bioscience and Biotechnology Research Council. We've been screening for potent activators of the system, looking at migration of the transcription factor into the nucleus. Um, we've been quantifying the damage to proteins, uh, the DNA and lipids, and, the aim, and then modeling the, the transcriptional activation and trying to maintain it activated with the intention of trying to develop healthier foods for re rejuvenation or at least healthier living. So in summary, proteins undergo continual spontaneous modifications in physiological systems increasing with age. Damaged proteins undergo proteolysis with excretion of damaged amino acids. Accumulation of protein damage in aging occurs as a consequence of increased rates of damage, decreased rates of repair of damaged proteins, and decreased rates of proteolysis and removal of damaged proteins. Oxidative and non-oxidative mechanisms are involved, such as the methylglyoxal damage, and we're working on persistent stimulation of NRF2 to try and 
prevent this damage and provide a healthy aging re rejuvenation effect. I thank all the people involved here, the group. Um, Naila Rabani co-supervises the group with me. We get funding from the UK Research Council's European Union. Uh, bio, we have a network, uh, uh, we have a program on biomarkers for vascular and metabolic health called BioClaims. And I mentioned the food industry is very interested in this area and we've already tapped them a little bit to support our research and collaboration, Nestle and Unilever. And we work with a lot of distinguished people, including Masi Yamamoto, the originator of the NOF2 field. Uh, and that's all I've got time for. Uh, thank you for your attention. Questions? So that was a fascinating three talks. <laughs> uh, you've obviously taken a speed talking course. Yeah. Um, so I have a question for you regarding the analysis. Are you looking at uh, complete digestion of triptych peptides, or are you digesting further to amino acids? Yeah, we're in, in the LCMS-MS analysis, I told you that, that I showed, I think, that we're digesting completely down to amino acids. So wouldn't you get the same information with the newest generation of LCMS TOF machines or TRAP machines, um, that which, which are really very <coughs> sensitive now? Yep. Uh, so when we want to simply quantify total damage, say, in a, in a tissue or a s fractional proteome like mitochondrial proteins, then we first start off by quantifying total amount of a particular damage type. And then we are experts at proteomics as well. And then we go on doing label-free proteomics and try to quantify, identify the sites and quantify the amounts of a particular damage uh, of course, the, the, uh, the urinary measurement also is nice because it's non-invasive. And there we can measure the, the damaged amino acids as a flux, but also there are some in very interesting peptides excreted in urine from partial proteolysis, which can help you identify particular proteins that have been damaged as well. But do the results agree? Uh, are, are they completely concordant whether you go down to amino acids or look at proteins by proteomic methods? Um, yeah, yeah, they do. Like uh, lipoprotein digestion is going to be mentioned by Naila Rabani later in this session. Yeah, of course, we're, we're careful to try and make everything fit. And of course, with the mathematical modeling we're doing, it ha the concentrations have to fit with the no reactivities of the modifying agents and the turnover of the damaged protein as well. Is there a biomarker here like the glycated uh, hemoglobin? Uh, well, there is methylglyoxal modified hemoglobin. There's methylglyoxal modified albumin. And have you looked at it, at that in, in relationship uh, to any uh, conditions? So we've studied in diabetes. Yeah, we see increases in diabetes. Methylglyoxal formation, unlike glycated hemoglobin, it, glucose out of this sensitive to both short-term <coughs> and long-term hyper, long hyperglycemia. So it's a better marker of glycemic status than HbA1c, actually. Okay. All right, thank you. So our next speaker is David Spiegel. He is...